Thank you, Bryant, for bringing us all here. And for those of you who were here this morning, this is a different part of the spirit of storytelling. Um, this morning's panel was so full of the reasons that we come to story. And now I'm speaking as one of the gatekeepers at Random House about the distribution of that story. And I hope that it still echoes of the richness and heart that brings us all here. Um, going to keep the intros very brief so that we can have as much time to hear from the wonderful panelists who are here with us today. The first being Jamia Wilson, who's an award-winning feminist activist, writer, speaker, and podcaster. Jamia joined Random House as vice president and executive editor in 2021. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> All right now. Uh, as the former director of feminist press at the City University of New York and the former VP of programs at Women's Media Center, Jamia has been a leading voice on women's rights issues for over a decade. And I invite you to read her full bio both at the Black Food Summit site and her own site. Nicole Taylor, who is a contributor to Black Food. Uh, her recipe for cocoa orange fish is delicious. <laughs> Nicole is a James Beard Award nominated food writer, master home cook, and producer. She has written for the New York Times, Bon Appetit, and Food and Wine. Nicole is the author of Watermelon and Red Birds, a cookbook for Juneteenth and Black Celebrations, The Up South Cookbook, and The Last OG Cookbook. And again, there's more on Nicole on her site. And Bryant, who brings us here today. James Beard, an NAACP Image Award-winning chef, educator, and author, renowned for his activism to create a healthy, just, and sustainable food system. He is the founder and editor-in-chief of Four Color Books, an imprint of Penguin Random House and 10 Speed Press, and he is founder, co-principal, and innovation director of the Zenmi Creative Studio. Since 2015, he has been the chef in residence here at the beautiful Museum of the, Amer of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, where he creates public programming at the intersection of food, farming, health, activism, art, and culture. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm Portia. I work at Random House. I've worked there for 18 years um, in a variety of capacities, having the opportunity to work with writers like Dr. Maya Angelou, uh, her son, Mr. Guy Johnson, who was a resident of this beloved city, uh, Ms. Morrison, and working on the Black um, the Black Book, Ms. Morrison's book, um, as an editor at Random House. And so my first question is... Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Not to interrupt. And we were so honored and privileged to have Portia Bird come on as one of the editors for Black Food. So. <laughs> okay. Yes, that was a huge blessing, and thank you. So... Something I often say to writers who are seeking publication, which is a very different way of sharing your story, that writing is something we do for ourselves. It's how we make sense of the world around us. It's how we process our thoughts and our emotions. But publishing, and in particular book publishing, is an act of service. It's rooted in the belief that sharing our writing can contribute value to others. So to get us started, can you each talk about what drove you to want to publish a book for the first time? Anyone? I'll start, sure, why not? <laughs> um, <laughs> writing a cookbook was the furthest thing from my mind. Being a food writer, I mean, 15 years ago, if you had asked me, or told me that I would be a food writer, I would have been like, no, no way possible. I basically wrote the Up South cookbook that came out in 2015 because I felt like it was the right thing to do to keep my career um, going upward. Uh, so many of my friends and colleagues around me were writing cookbooks and someone said, you should write a cookbook. Uh, I saw value in telling my story and writing down the recipes um, that I hold dear, recipes that really are linked to me moving from Georgia to New York back in 2008. So for me, it just felt natural, like a natural progression in my career. Okay. I write as a form of healing as a writer. So I'm on both sides of the desk. I'm an editor. I've been a publisher in my, in my last life, uh, and I am a writer, and I still write, and 
it's something that I need like oxygen or water uh, in order to make sense of my life, my spirituality, and also to connect with my ancestors. And it's something that I know I would do even if I didn't get paid for it. Uh, but I need to get paid for it. Uh, don't get it twisted. <laughs> I just want to be clear about that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's something that is profoundly integral to life. It's why I believe in my tradition that spirit put me here mm -hmm. to be a storyteller, to be a communicator to be a conduit of stories for people, to be a midwife of other people's stories. Uh, and I've always been someone who would wanna sit at the knee of all the elders in my family. I was blessed to have my grandmothers in their 90s and my great-grandmother. And to hear all those stories and to really see how that would transport us between time and space and the veil of life and death and just have always wanted to lean into that. So. When I had the opportunity to publish, it was a nice extension of that affirmation of, oh, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what you're meant to do. But for me, it's really about a calling. And it's also about testimony, about devotion, humility. I learn a lot of humility by being a writer. Um, I am not one of those linear writers who gets in front of my computer and starts to type and... Uh, feels certain about what I do. No, I'm somebody who, whose mind that is very active <laughs> and not disorganized uh, works itself out on the page. So I think I'd be lying to you if I said something super um, articulate or eloquent about it being something that I do formulaically or structurally when in fact it's something that I have to do as a way of self-regulation and healing. And I recommend it <laughs> for those who are healing um, or finding their ways of working through trauma or trying to make meaning of our life here. So <clears throat> I often have to um, let people who've come to my work more recently know that before I started, before I thought about writing a book or being, having a media presence or any of that, uh, my work in the food space started as a grassroots activist when I founded this organization, Be Healthy, in um, 2001 that used cooking as a way to um, organize and empower and um, create a new generation of revolutionaries who are committed to help building a more healthful and just and sustainable food system. So the initial impetus for me writing or publishing a book um, was... I really saw it as a base building tool. I, I saw it as an extension of the grassroots activism that I was doing and having worked with young people and um, knowing that many of these young people who are you know, from the lower economic strata of New York City, um, they were in homes where their parents were working two, sometimes three low wage jobs. So in terms of home cooking, they weren't practicing home cooking because they didn't have parents and mentors who were able to pass those traditions on. And I knew that um, this was an important tool that we have to continue to um, impart to all of us, eaters, if we wanna build a more healthful and just and sustainable food system. But then the other thing that really excited me about writing um, a book was this quote, and I didn't wanna bungle it, so I uh, <laughs> pulled it up, but Toni Morrison, uh, when she um, said, if there's a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. And I had, you know, being a, a vegan since I was in high school, or at least starting that journey in high school, and being a, a part of this rich tradition of people of African descent who were growing food and cooking it and eating it, and really had an emphasis on, like, plant-based eating, you know, from the Seven Day at Venice that I first learned about veganism from to, um, you know, kind of being a part of this Rastafarian community in the, the health food store in downtown Memphis where I used to go and eat sprouts and brown rice and <laughs> overcooked broccoli. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, to the tradition, learning more about the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and how many of their Free Breakfast for Children program sites were actually plant-based. And so I knew that 
black folks have this tradition of eating in that way, um, contrary to the the ways in which the the kind of wider culture or the popular media likes to erase that history or you know just you know this paternalistic um, way in which they talk about black folks needing to be taught how to eat. And I wanted to have a book that celebrated our um, culturally specific cuisine, um, but with plant-based foods. And um, you know, there are some books that had been written, self-published, but I, I felt like there needed to be an updated version of this um, through a radical food justice lens. And so that is what led me to uh, write or co-author my first book, Grub, Ideas for an Urban Organic Kitchen uh, with my um, friend and colleague, Anna LaPay. And one of the things that we were really intent on doing, because there are a lot of books that were coming out around that time, Michael Pollan's, um, uh, I forget what his, which book, but Michael Pollan, Nina Planick, there were interesting books that were talking about the systemic problems in our food system. But we found that, A, those books didn't seem to speak to our generation. Uh, B, they weren't solutions oriented. You know, you almost left feeling overwhelmed with these huge problems in our food system. And we wanted to write a book that gave people uh, practical tools and tips that they can implement in their personal lives, in their communities, and then even thinking about how they can be activist citizens to make policy changes. And we also wanted it to have recipes so that people could take the book and immediately go into action by um, cooking local, seasonal, sustainable, plant-forward food. And so, um, you know, my um, career as an author unfolded from there. Service at the heart of it all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that was your career as an author. But what was it about your experience, and you mentioned first self-publishing, and now your current imprint is quite the opposite of self-publishing. What made you want to transition to that side of the business, and Jamia as a professional and an author, can you talk about that as well? First. So one, uh, I wanted to thank Bryant when he was talking about and I think it connects to this question, what, what it would mean to make the publishing impact to get these books to more people that are really accessible and active. And I wanna thank you because my late mom, who was awesome, had left all of these dog-eared copies of her books and cookbooks and many of your books are among those that I have now with her notes and she really attributed her first remission to transitioning to a mostly plant-based diet. And we talked about, because I said, oh, mom, you know, actually, <laughs> I'm connected with him. But, you know, she didn't know that, that she sought your book out before she knew this. Um, and so for her to be able to go into a bookstore in rural North Carolina, mm. have a diagnosis where uh, twice as many black women die than white women um, in that particular cancer cross class, um, to have a book like this that could connect her to community, connect her to the foods that she found home in and found connection to her ancestors in and thinking, oh, I don't have to change my lifestyle. I don't have to give up cornbread. I don't have to give up black eyed peas. I don't have to give up these other things that make me feel connected to community as I go through this, but I can have them in this different way. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't need a, a ham hock uh, included in this equation. So. Anyhow, I just wanted to thank you for that because I've been meaning to tell you that for a while. But I think for me, that's what, that's what big publishing can do. Yeah. Um, that that, sh that book was easily accessible to her in her time of need mm -hmm. um, with a connection and a feeling of home and a feeling of community. And that's why I started in publishing in an in independent feminist house with a mission-driven um, mandate because... So much of what Florence Howe, the founder of Feminist Press, wanted uh, to contribute to the world was to find those lost works that were lost because of all of this systemic reasons, to enliven those stories that had been left behind, making us think, oh, there just must not have ever been women writers, there must not have ever been trans writers, there must not have ever been black writers, because we haven't found, we haven't seen them. It's like the binder swill of women um, thing for anyone who could remember that. And so, just knowing that Florence, who was a very progressive, visionary, comparative liter literature teacher, uh, 
daughter of a taxi driver of Russian descent in Brooklyn who adopted a black daughter in freedom schools, uh, was doing intersectional black feminist readers in the 70s before it was woke to do so, as I'm putting in quotes. Um, and that just called to me, it spoke to me, to think about how there is this thirst that the press had had for, at the time I joined, 47 years, um, to, fill, to fill the void, to tell the stories, to center the stories. Um, and so we created a new mission as we were getting ready for the 50th anniversary, which was to create a more just world where everyone can recognize themselves in a book. Um, and in our collective thinking about, you know, what is it, why do we exist? Why are we doing it? So I continue to carry that in my heart as the reason why I work to publish, but I think in terms of my move over to Random House, it was really about thinking about her desire also to create a springboard for those books once enlivened and uh, more widely available to be able to uh, have a tremendous impact on a wider reach. And so I see my move into this role as being a natural extension um, to the vision that she already had. She and I had a conversation before she passed a few years ago. Um, and as you can tell, she's someone who means a great deal to me, a great mentor. She said, oh, I thought that we would only be around 10 years. I can't believe we made it 50 years, and the reason I thought we'd be around 10 years is I just thought everyone would get it, and everyone would just publish feminist books, because they would get that we need intersectional feminism everywhere, <laughs> and we'll need it, and now it just looks like we're gonna need to be around for 50, 100, 1,000 years more, but um, I think about that a lot too, that, that we need people doing that really important focused work in those spaces, and we also need people in all spaces who are bringing that eye and those questions to places where there is a platform and, and there are resources to widely distribute and um, widely promote with deep impact, all stories. So that's one of the reasons why I think it's important for everyone who's thinking about where they wanna find a home for their book um, to consider who is my audience? Who am I trying to reach? That I don't necessarily believe there's one best publishing experience, but I do believe there's a best publishing experience for you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another reason uh, why I'm also leaning into this work on, on the production and publishing side. Thank you, Jamia. Brian? So, you know, in order to talk about my desire to become a publisher, we have to go back to a book. It was a book that really launched my publishing career and I saw the power of um, the way in which information being spread could just create these connections that one might not even have ever imagined. And I, I do want to say that, because uh, I, I think I have the, one of the reasons I'm so excited about being a publisher now is I have the experience of uh, being an author of six books. And so now, in addition to being like a publisher and building a team and working with an amazing team at 10 Speed Press, I have um, the capacity to coach and really work with the authors closely and coach them through what I've been through a number of times. But I want to say for um, people who are interested in publishing, um, at least share my experience that it's always been a very spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. And in terms of you know, me even entering this work around food systems, it was, it, it came out of a lot of like deep contemplation and meditation and a spiritual practice that led me to this. And I think that that deep spiritual work also led me to um, then, you know, become an author because it helped me to slow down and be more mindful and present with the connections and the people I'm meeting and the signs and symbols. So there was this book that came out, The Future 500, mm -hmm. um, probably, you remember that book? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was this book that came out around 2000, 2001, but it was um, kind of capturing like all the youth activism that was happening in that historical moment. And my organization that I founded, Be Healthy, um, we were featured in the book, and we were upstart, you know, organization, barely had a pot to pee in, but um, 
so because of that, it had my home address. We didn't have an office or anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, Anna LaPay, who I went on to um, co-author Grub with, she lived um, near me in Brooklyn and read about the organization and saw that we lived near each other and just kind of reached out, cold call, like, hey, we live near each other. I do all this work around, you know, food systems and, you know, hunger and nutrition and whatever. And so let's meet up. And little did I know that she was the Anna Le- well Anna LePay, the daughter of the Francis Moore LePay, who wrote "Died for a Planet," "Died for a Small Planet" in the 1970s. And so we became friends, and you know, initially in that relationship, I'm all like, "Damn, I want to write a book with her," but I also don't want to tell her because I don't want to think this is some exploitative relationship. <laughs> And so then um, she approached me with the idea of us co-authoring a book. So this gets me to the first book project that we worked on, which was bought by Penguin, um, Tarcher, which is um, one of the uh, uh, imprints of Penguin back in the day. And it was a very unrealistic first publishing experience. I went into it because we went in with Anna's mother being our mentor. She's a powerful, you know, like powerhouse within the publishing world. So she got us an agent, which off the top, just finding an agent as a new author can be like, that's one of the barriers that a lot of like, you know, budding authors like, well, how do I get an agent? Like, how do you, how does one even find an agent? Like, what's that process like? So then that was easy. So I'm like, okay, cool. This is going smoothly. And then we got the deal and we got a, I'll tell you the number. I mean, it don't seem like that much now, but back then we got a $75,000 advance and I'm like, holy moly, we killing it, right? So coming off of that book, And then my agent and I were shopping a book that I would write, um, which would go on to be Vegan Soul Kitchen, in 2007. And we shopped that book around to about a dozen publishers, and then 10 just flat out said no. And, you know, interestingly, in, 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 in retrospect, it's just really disgusting when I think about it, because what they are essentially were saying is that um, black folks don't eat vegetables. Mm-hmm. This book is not going to sell. You know, they said it politely. You're cutting the pie too thinly. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> vegan, black people, it's too niche. And so... It's what it's you know as a an author and now as a publisher is one of the things that I often stress to um, people who are interested in publishing the people who are on the ground the creatives the folks who are in the field doing the work we're the experts and not that the publishing houses don't have. Uh, their level of expertise, but not only do we have a sense of what the, con- the, the the kind of current zeitgeist is, but we also have this ability to see what the emerging zeitgeist will be, right? And so, you know, fast forward to this year, black people are the fastest growing population of vegans in North America. But back then, it was just like they couldn't many of these publishers couldn't see that this would have like some viable audience. And um, so, you know, finally got a deal um, from a publisher who believed in what we um, were doing and then, you know, kind of on from there. But um, I'll say that a big, you know, one of the impetus for me wanting to do this was 2020 when we were learning that um, in this, in the wake of what people are calling the racial reckoning um, post Breonna Taylor and George Floyd's um, state murders, you know, there was a revelation of a lot of racism within food media. You know, many of the um, legacy food media um, magazines and some publishing houses. And it really just harkened this early period where I'm just like, if we don't have people who look like us on the other side, then you're just gonna get in all types of trouble. I mean, and, and we could talk about that from the design standpoint. You know, we were hearing it earlier about just simply editing and people not having like the cultural competency or relevant, you know, just the understanding of like what you're trying to do. And oftentimes you need people, if not, you know, I mean, who are steeped in this culture and who get it. And you don't have to do a lot of explaining. And so I just want to. Uh, pay it forward. You know, I feel like I've been so blessed and honored to be in publishing. And I know there are a lot of diverse and interesting stories that um, should be told. And I want to continue to um, use my power and platform and privilege to support uh, people who need to get the work out there. Thank you. And thank you both for doing that. All of us up here 
are representing a particular portion of that publishing world. I mean, you're the publisher, so you represent all of it. Congratulations again. It's <laughs> wonderful to be able to say that. Um, who isn't here, and as someone, a part of my job is both editorial, but I also work on a lot of diversity and equity and inclusion initiatives for the company. And one space where we are still super underrepresented demographically is with publicity in particular. So you can have an editor, and I've had, you know, some of my authors have said this, they're so excited to work with me editorially and know that their, you know, language they will put on the page that I get and will continue to fight for it through copy editing, but then are very disappointed when it comes time for their publicity campaign and their podcasts aren't reaching the audiences that they had in mind when creating the work. Nicole, I would love to ask <laughs> you, as someone whose cookbook came out very recently, yeah. um, what your publicity experience was. I mean, um, people in the room, how many people have their copies of Watermelon and Red Birds? Okay, we need more hands up. I mean, <laughs> if you don't have a copy, I'm almost positive that you actually either saw me on the Today Show or saw me in the San Francisco, read about me in the San Francisco Chronicle or the Washington Post. I was everywhere all over this, this summer and even now. Uh, but I'll, I'll have to go back a little bit because my introduction, I was trying to keep it short, but I should have kept it long about how I came, <laughs> about, about how I came in this space. I actually had a podcast pre podcast boom. Um, so from 2009 all the way up to 2014, I hosted a podcast on Heritage Radio Network, which is still a very indie food uh, radio uh, station. And I built a community. Um, I lived in New York City for almost 20 years, split my time back and forth from Georgia, but I have deep connections with people. And so when I did my first cookbook and I had a little bitty small advance and really the publisher did not put any marketing dollars behind that, um, I used my community. Uh, I didn't sell a bunch of books, but I worked, worked the room. Um, when the last OG came out, which is a very different scenario and that I should share. So I was basically what they call work for hire. And the last OG is a cookbook that is inspired by uh, the TV sitcom, the TBS sitcom called The Last OG with Tracy Morgan in it. So I got a call. I was like seven months pregnant. And this was actually from the person that ended up being my editor. I met him at a party and he said, we have a book um, that we want you to write, but I can't tell you the name, but it's about food and black people. <laughs> and I, the only thing that I could think of that was on TV at the time, I dropped down on the floor. I was like, Queen Sugar. I'm uh -oh. <laughs> but then I'm like, that doesn't make sense. I'm like, eh, this is already based on a book. Why would they be calling me? And then they called back and they were like, well, we're putting in a bid. We're trying to sell it to a major publisher, which they did. Um, and I got the deal. And that book kind of changed my life because I realized like, oh, you can get a way bigger advance for just writing recipes and putting words down. But not only putting words, one of the things that I understood that they hired me for was to conceptualize black food, to conceptualize what it means to be a person who is incarcerated and then comes back to their gentrified Brooklyn neighborhood and is trying to uh, get a job in the food world, right? Um, so I, I understood the assignment. I did that. I didn't have to do any publicity for that because it was a TV show. Even though Tracy Morgan did get on TV and say that was his mom, um, mom's chicken and waffle recipe. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's how it goes when you are for hire. So if you open up the copy of that book, the front page says recipes written by Nicole Taylor. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to Watermelon and Red Birds. Um, I must say, I've had a beautiful collaborative experience working with Simon & Schuster's publicity and marketing team. Um, so much so that all of my cookbook author friends were like, you know they don't send you on tour anymore. They sending you on a book tour? Um, and I'm like, yeah. Uh, but I will say that I was able still to leverage my contacts when it came down to publicity and marketing. and. 
I made sure I made my voice heard very early on that I just didn't want them to do everything that I wanted to be in the mix of what they were planning. Um, and so I, I always tell young authors like, you need to be um, more in line <laughs> with the marketing and publicity folks than your editor. I'm, j I'm saying that as a joke, but you want them to like you more than anything. Those are the people who, are have, to, who have to stand up at sales meeting meetings and pitch your book. Those are the folks who are talking directly to Target, mm -hmm. dare I say it, Walmart, Amazon. Books um, a million. Books a million. Mm -hmm. I know we probably talk about that a little bit later, but those are the people who, who craft the language to talk about your book, and you can help them craft the language to talk to the book. So for me, to talk about the book, so for me, I've been blessed to um, have had and still having uh, a collaborative relationship with them. And I know, I'm like, wait, they're still helping me out here? The book is like, you know, out in the world. Um, but I will say 100%, some of that has to do with my track record of knowing everyone in food media and yeah. saying, oh, they didn't email you? Let me just send them a text. Mm -hmm. Can I um, jump in? Yeah. Um, the first thing I want to say for, um, you know, authors, budding authors, is that you have to have a real realistic expectations about what you'll get from marketing and publicity as a new author, because the reality is you have to prove yourself. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna do so much for you until they see that, oh, we this is gonna be a sure shot, or at least, you know, most likely if we invest a lot in marketing and promoting a problem a project. I, I, I always say to potential um, authors, budding authors, that you have to be your own publicity machine. And I'll tell you on that kind of like uh, tip of just the spiritual practices, listening to the signs and symbols, when I was moving from the um, Brooklyn to the Bay, uh, my ex-girlfriend and I were driving across country and we were trying to make it to the Bay, but we just like were so burnt out by Bakersfield mm. that... Uh, <laughs> That we stopped there. I, I recommend not spending a night in Bakersfield. Um, but anyway, we stopped in Bakersfield, got a room at this hotel. And then I remember waking up at around 3 a.m. And just it just felt like something woke me up. And I got up and turned the TV on. And there was this documentary on VH1 about Kanye West. And it was so important for me that, to see that documentary because it talked about, I mean, a, a lot of this is just kind of like, common knowledge now, especially after his Netflix, um, the three-part documentary. But um, this was 2005. And so I didn't know this history of, you know, the struggles he had from transitioning from being a producer to a rapper and how he was trying, he believed so much in himself and he knew that he was going to be the star that he is, but the people at his record label didn't, or at least they didn't want to like hand this new kind of role to him. And so what did he do? He went into his pockets and he started investing in his own projects and promoting them where he basically had to force their hand. You know, he did three videos for Jesus Walks. The black and white one is dope if you haven't seen that one where it's like in Chicago. Um, and so when I saw that, that was one of those moments that made me realize that when if I go into my pockets to invest in marketing and promoting my book. It's an investment in, my, in myself. Like I shouldn't hesitate to do that. And so I always tell people that if you're uh, the marketing department at your publisher, if they are doing you know, stuff for you, give thanks. But don't depend on it. Like, don't like go into a book project. Like, oh, I'm just gonna write the book, and then they're gonna, you know, take it and run with it. Like, one, if they see that you're putting effort in, that actually gives them more confidence to feel like, well, we want to help supporting because we see you out here networking, using your contacts, um, and, and really, you know, making moves on your own. But to a point that we spoke about earlier, oftentimes there are these outlets and individuals and journalists and connections that they may not have any idea about that we have to bring to you know their attention we need to use our contacts we need to you know let them know that yeah great sure you want to get me in people magazine but i want to be in ebony and jet and i mean i don't know if that works anymore but as an example you know being in the more like um, culturally specific media that may not be something that they typically 
will um, focus on. So I think it has to be that kind of meeting where you trust their um, experience because that's something I had to learn also is in the hard way, which I, I, I try to impart to um, authors. We talk about this a lot, just this new generation of genera uh, the Generation Z um, <laughs> um, creatives. And I mean, I get it. Like, I was there before. I think I was there with Vegan Soul Kitchen, you know, just sometimes uh, we have to understand that the people who have been doing this have a, a certain level of knowledge and expertise that we should listen to. And also there are moments where we should push back and understand that we, we have a lot to bring to the table too. So I think it's just this kind of like delicate like dance that you have to figure out and that's really just through experience. Thank you for saying that so positively. <laughs> <laughs> it was so encouraging. Um, because from where I sit, you know, I can think about the EL doctoros, right, who would sit at a table and say, no, my job is to be the writer, and I put it in the hands of the machine so that the machine can go ahead and sell it, and that's definitely a space of privilege, and so then on the other side, the authors who are having the opposite experience feel pretty upset, and so to hear that actually it is empowering to have that information yourself and to be able to share that with the machine, not even just so that you benefit, but again, then all of the others who will come after you, those dreaded comp titles that mm -hmm. we need to publish to, will also be able to benefit from that work. Just thank you for doing that. Yeah. Before we open this to questions, because I'm sure many of you have them, I do want to ask one thing about that's kind of related to this question we're talking about with regards to publicizing and who your audience is and how to reach them. And because each of you are a part of the big publishing machines, how do you balance centering the diaspora mm -hmm. in the work that you're doing while also inviting everyone across cultures mm -hmm. to access your work? Especially I think about watermelon that as a cookbook, it started as a Juneteenth cookbook, yeah. but then your subtitle also says, and black celebrations, mm -hmm. to broaden that out from being one day to being year long. Yeah. How do you experience that? Uh, Watermelon and Red Birds, a cookbook for Juneteenth and black celebrations. Uh, the number one question I would say I get beyond what, tell me about the Red Birds, is, is this book for me? Um, and I always say, yeah, yes, it is. Uh, I will say, though, that there was no hesitation when I was having a conversation with my first editor. I'm on my third editor um, with this book. Uh, when I said, I want to broaden this book, I want to give it some legs, mm. and we added a Black Celebrations. Um, I, when you read the head notes and the essays, I am speaking directly to black people. Um, but I also put in plenty of cultural cues that I'm saying to all Americans that you are a part of this story. You can be a part of honoring Juneteenth. Um, but to answer your question more specifically, uh, yeah, I knew from the very beginning that I wanted to write exactly how I talk, okay? I wanted to make sure that the black vernacular was in there when it could be. Uh, I wanted to make sure if someone in the audience that knows me that it sounds like a, a phone call with me or a voice memo with me. Um, so I was clear about that. And I think because of the racial reckoning of 2020, Nobody, nobody said, no, there was no pushback, but I'm gonna keep it real. If that was 2014 or my previous books, there would have been pushback, 100%. So can I get nerdy for a second? So um, I'm just gonna do that right now. Uh, one of the things that delights me, so I'm an editor, so I like detail. I like detail oriented. I remember once there was a review I had at a job where it was a negative review. They said too detail oriented. <laughs> but I kind of love this uh, because it allows, you know, for like my positive and toxic traits to intersect in a great way to help other people. Uh, but one of the things that I love about sort of the data and the science of publishing, if I may, the art of publishing, is that there are ways that we can look at these infrastructural 
realities and these infrastructural lenses that we use to value things, to tag things algorithmically, to measure what works and what doesn't work, how we position it, who gets to see it, um, how we make a subtitle be more inviting to a wider group, to really get into those kinds of details to widen the audience. And that's why I think having a literacy around how this industry works for anyone who's aspiring to do one of these books is important. I've noticed with friends who talk to me about how to get a book that it's like asking people who don't like to eat their vegetables to eat their vegetables. <laughs> but I'm saying it's gonna serve you, you know, it's, it's really gonna serve you to know how this system works to ask the right questions. I love when I have an author who says, can you tell me why you picked the BISAC codes that you did that are tagged in how my Amazon or other bookshop.org site talks about my book. I want to understand why you picked women in business. I want to understand why you picked African American, Asian. You know, that that they want to understand that. Can you broaden this to say business and and women is business as the next code? Yeah. I enjoy and savor, <laughs> since we're talking about black food today, I enjoy and savor the deliciousness of that kind of savvy author because that also shows that we are partners in making sure that every facet of the process um, is in the service of the highest good for the book, the life of the book, and also the long-term career of the author. I think it's really important to get those details right at the jump because I always think about when I'm acquiring someone, I'm always thinking long-term, is this someone who I want to work with for life? I'm sort of a monogamistic creature, you know? I like, if we work together and we work well, I want to keep working with you. <laughs> um, you know, I, I like to really deep deepen relationship. And I think that's a way to kind of get in on the detail in addition to the editorial and marketing conversations you're having to really think about what are those pieces that might feel like the math, that might feel like the vegetables. Oh, we like vegetables here. Um, and to talk about how we can incorporate in the details of the book, how the cover looks, how the title is presented, how the subhead copy looks to invite more people. And I'll give an example. So um, one of my first acquisitions at Random House was Victor Ray's On Critical Race Theory, Why We Should All Care. We did that subheader about why we should all care because as POC, the author and myself, we both experienced the people saying, oh, well, do I need to know about critical race theory? Does that involve me? <laughs> Is that for me? Um, but yes, it, you, it's being, you know, no matter where you kind of are on the, th on the conversation front, it is being weaponized um, in the conversation. You're seeing it show up in policies. You're seeing it, uh, a lot of misinformation um, around it. And this book was a real primer about what it's actually about. And the fact that we worked closely together to think about how do we make a subheader that lets people come in and see themselves in this book, even if they don't yet understand that critical race theory involves all of us, um, was just an honor to be a part of. And what's great now, even though I don't advise that authors read the comments on every review page usually, um, what's great now mm -hmm. I'm seeing is in the reviews that people really understood the promise of the book and the choices we made about positioning it in that way. So uh, although there's a lot that can be discussed and I don't wanna be reductive, I think that we can think about those tools that are supposed to be agnostic I'm not sure they are because you know whoever builds tools infuse they're, they're infusing that energy in the tool, right? But we can take those tools and think about how to strategically and smartly use them to benefit liberation in the form of books. So I just want to talk more about that and really think that there's so much ground that we can cover together um, if if we're willing to get past the tedium part. Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, double down on Jamia's um, don't read reviews of your book. <laughs> yeah, just, just, just don't. Um, oh, really? <laughs> I read them all the time. Really? I do. Oh, well, you must have people not crapping on your book then. <laughs> I do. Um, you know, 
I don't even know if I want to bring attention to this review, so I'm not going to even like tell you what book it is. But there was one person who wrote the nastiest review for one of my books, and it was just so frustrating to me because they get to write this review. I don't get to respond at all. I don't get to kind of explicate anything about like what the process was or like what they got wrong. And they got so much wrong. You know what I mean? Like just it was a total like misreading. Um, but I just want to go back to something that uh, Jamia said, which or she kind of touched on it. And I think it's important that as an author, you have a real strong sense of your identity as an author Ooh, and then having yes. a strong sense of what your book's identity is, what you want the um, kind of like um, everything, the visual identity, like, and, and not that these things can't shift, but I always tell people don't go in as a blank palette. Because if they don't, if their publisher doesn't have anything to work with, then they're going to make it whatever they think it should be to be whatever they think it should be. So I, I, I think that's an important point. But um, going back to your question, Portia, um, you know, I always like people, the wider culture, like loves black culture. Mm -hmm. They love black food, love, what's that saying? Like people love, what black cultural productions, but you know, don't like black people. And so one of the things that I was very clear about when I reached out to the, you know, more than 100 contributors to black food is that so often we have had to write and create things, or not have had to, but we felt like we have had to for various reasons to um, create through the, the, the um, white gaze. And like, you know, always kind of having concern, am I translate, is this gonna make sense for the wider culture or like, you know, other people? And I understand the, the complicated reasons why people do that. But with this book, I was very clear with every contributor. I was like, listen, I want you to write your piece, contribute your recipe, your poem, your essay with no concern for the white gaze. And we want this a book you know, I was jokingly saying this is FUBU for us, by us. <laughs> and, you know, it is because I'm like, look, we want to have a conversation among each other and we'll invite everyone into it. And I know that there wouldn't be any hesitancy for people coming in. And I think people want authentic stories. They want to be immersed in culture. I mean, one of my favorite films is um, the Korean film uh, Parasite to the dismay of my wife, because I watch it like once a week. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, I mean, this is a culture that I'm not familiar with, but it's such a compelling story and it's so well done and cinematography. And so I think that for me, I knew that if we approach black food in that way, where we're just letting people be who they are, they're telling the real deal, that it would resonate with people because they want to feel that. And you know, I, I mean, look, I know that this book has a diverse reach, but a lot of white people, buy my book. They send me messages and comments and emails. And so I think that it's important that we create these works in the most authentic way possible. And I think people feel that. People can tell when you're kowtowing or if you're trying to, you know, write to reach the biggest audience. I think people like intuitively get that and they intuitively feel when it's authentic and real. That's right. Thank you. Elizabeth? Question time. I just want to thank each and every one of you. You're providing church and the gospel, and I greatly appreciate it. <laughs> with that being said, for aspiring authors, do you think it's better to test the water with your concept and self-publish, or do you need to invest more time in building community? I would say you could do both. Uh, I actually self-published about three zines around black travel and food before or after my first book, I can't remember, but I wanted, I was having a, crazily, I was pitching a lot of black travel stories to big publications and they were like, nah. And I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna do my own zine on Philadelphia and things that I think that are important in Philadelphia. I'm gonna do my own zine on fried chicken in New York City. So I would say you can self-publish I mean, maybe not do your whole book, but what other things you're interested in and you could do very lo-fi and do a zine or whatever concept. And community over everything, that's my motto. You can't accomplish um, you know, book sales and 
you know, events like this without a strong community. So community over everything for sure. I love this question. Uh, I think when I, I have friends ask me almost every day, or friends of friends, I'm sure you all have this too. Uh, I, I got to get a book out there. Should I do? What, should I self-publish? Should I not? What, what should I do? How do I get an agent? I get those questions a lot. And one of the things I like to ask people first is, what is your goal? Mm -hmm. I think that having a really sharp vision about what your goal is helps you answer that question. Who are you trying to reach? How are you trying to reach them? Um, how many copies of the book do you want to sell? Uh, what is your timeline? All of that. I believe that there are many different challenges and opportunities that come with each format and different kinds of ways that you can publish. And only you can know what your goal is uh, to help you determine the direction you want to go and what your timeline is. Um, and sometimes people are just saying, oh, I'm having a real material reason to get a big deal right now. 